recently at Waypoint One, we've been covering Mark chapter 11. And through that teaching, we brought up a number of interesting biblical principles. And as I've been going through the Bible, I've come across a couple of stories that tend to illustrate what it was we talked about. And so my heart has kind of moved into the idea that I want to continue that idea we were speaking of when we were together. And so I want to cover the, the little section again, and then I want to bring off an afterthought. And that's what I want to call this. Uh, waypoint one, afterthought. Now, we remember in Mark chapter 11, verse 12, it said, Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, verse 15 through verse 19 is a different story. He's passing by. He sees this tree. The tree has leaves, and, it, it, and the leaves make it appear as though maybe it bears fruit. It gave the the signs of having fruit, the appearance of having fruit, and therefore Jesus thought that maybe the tree was an early bloomer. It said it's not the, not the time for figs, but it certainly showed indications that it should have had figs. And so when he went to the tree and he didn't find anything, he gave it a curse. He cursed it. Now on the way by, he goes to the temple and he cleanses it out. So when we get to verse 20, it says, Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. We discussed the fact that when you're talking about this fig tree, this fig tree has the idea or the presumption that it was it would it would bear fruit. And in our Christian lives, we need to bear fruit too. The, the fruits of the Spirit that are, il, that are illustrated in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, of which there is no law. What we're talking about is the idea that when we have the Spirit in us, when we have accepted Jesus to be our Christ, and when we become servants of His, our lives should look like We've been with Jesus, and we should bear fruit for others. By Because be bearing fruit for others is love towards your neighbor and towards God. Jesus cursed this, the fig tree because, although it had all the signs and symptoms of being religious, being a fruit tree, there was no fruit. And that made Jesus mad. If you read the letter to Laodicea and uh, in Revelation chapter 3, you'll find out what he thinks, what Jesus thinks about lukewarm Christians. But as I was doing my reading this week, I was looking in 1 Samuel, and so much of that story, that fig tree that was cursed by Jesus because it looked religious but didn't bear the fruit, well, it shows itself in Saul, King Saul. And so I want to share with you a second, a second story to illustrate what's going on there. And just very quickly, so that we don't cover the whole thing, in chapter 10, King Saul anoints, or um, Samuel the prophet anoints King Saul king. He anoints him king. And some people are not very happy about that idea until Saul comes to their aid. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. It, the, the Bible says that he's changed into a new man, that the Spirit has come upon him and he has a new heart. And in winning a tremendous battle and saving some people in Israel, they certainly see that he is a man who can be king. But from there, we start seeing religious religiosity, religious behaviors, but those behaviors don't bear fruit. And that's the important part of this, because so far as we move into uh, these last days, when the Bible tells us that There'll be many people with itching ears, seeking doctrines that 
that make them feel good. By the way, the Greek word for itching ears is a Greek word that connotates the fact of, of, of pleasant sounding things. Well, prophecy is not pleasant. Nothing pleasant about what's coming. Nothing. And the Bible is warning us, not so we'd be afraid, but because we'd be ready, we would understand that why God has told us the end from the beginning. And therefore, we need to know that it's going to be doom and gloom because at that point, we can be excited that the Bible is real and that Jesus' promises to come and get us out of it are true. But so many churches right now are, are being pulled away from from doctrines, from sound doctrine of the Bible. So many churches now look or have the power of religiosity, but they're denying the power of Jesus and the word of God therein. That's a problem, and that's where Saul finds himself. Look what happens starting in chapter 13. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. Jonathan's his son. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. So really quickly, we start to see a personality defect in Saul because he has an issue for, a, he's got a pride issue. He, he's got an insecurity issue. And so he has his 2,000 men in Michmash to the north. Jonathan, his son, who we find out later on and throughout for Samuel, is a man who's very close to God, who loves God and believes in God. He has a 1,000 men in Gibeah to the south. And then, of course, what happens is Jonathan takes out the Philistines, but Saul takes credit for it and blows the trumpet and tells the nation that it was him who had that win when it, in, when it was actually Jonathan. Now, Jonathan gives glory to God in his wins, but Saul takes the glory for himself. Not that this is a huge thing, but it is a, it is a character fall, flaw that is going to slip him deeper and deeper away from God in a great apostasy and closer and closer to his doom. Verse 5 says, Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people at the sand, which is in the seashore, is multitude. And then they came up and they encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and in thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and of Gilead. Well, the he go, Jonathan goes and he beats the Philistines. You have King Saul who struts around saying that he's the one who did it. And then the Philistines bring a giant army back against Saul because Philistines who are beat by Jonathan think it's, he's being, he got beat by Saul and so he comes against Saul. And now Saul and all his men are freaking out because they weren't involved in that battle. And now Saul has thrown them into a battle that they can't win. So they're hiding and they're running and they're scampering away. And it says, as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. And then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. So Saul, Saul, so Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, and he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered against, uh, together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Here's what happens. 
Saul sees this giant army. He sees all of his people are starting to scatter because they're afraid. He's waiting for the prophet Samuel to come and offer a burnt offering and to pray to God, but he doesn't come on time. And Saul freaks out. And so what, he, what does he do? He, he, he goes against the law. Only a Levite can, uh, only a Levite can offer a, a, a godly sacrifice. Only a Levite, only a priest can or a prophet. And he's waiting for the prophet to do this, but he doesn't. And so he takes up arms to be religious. It looks religious, but the heart of, relig of religion is not the same as having the heart as a relationship with Jesus Christ. So he does a bunch of works that look good, but they're in, in direct defiance of what God has asked him to do. So he looks good while sinning against God. And that's not a good place to be. Because if you're doing works and not doing it to love God, because you're not listening to the obedience of God, then what you're doing is worthless. And it creates drama. And it does here. Samuel gets here a little bit later, sees that he's already offered up this burnt offering. And he's like, what are you doing? You know that that's not how this works. You know that's not what God wants. You know that's not obedience to God. And Saul says, well, I saw all these people freaking out and I needed to pull them close together and I needed to seek after God, even though he's, that's not what he was really doing, because being obedient to God is far better than doing the work. We'll talk about it in a little while. And so he says, uh, well, I was compelled, I was forced to have to offer up this thing. And Samuel's like, what are you talking about? Here's what it says in 13. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly and you have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. He would have won that battle and you'd be king forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded you. A man after his own heart. That's King David. David had a heart after God. David will seek after God. David will pray to God and God will deliver him and all kinds of things. Now, there are times in David's life where he kind of loses it a little bit and he fails to follow God's lead. But for the most part, his whole life has been bent on following God's word. And, Saul, and Samuel tells Saul, well, you are going to be king forever, but except for the fact that you failed to obey the God who gave you your position, and now, therefore, he's going to take the kingdom away and give it to somebody better. And if you're an insecure king and you're worried about those kinds of things, you're worried about being the king that you don't know if you can be or not, then someone telling you your kingdom is gone for to somebody better is going to rip you to pieces. Verse, thir uh, verse 15, then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Okay, so, so to start here, remember, the tree that Jesus cursed had leaves as if it was religious, if it, if it had fruits, but did not bear fruit. So it was, it was all, it was all show and no dough, as we say, right? And all show, but no substance, no Christian obedient substance to bear fruit to other people. It's a tree that cares only for itself, not to give away that which it makes for others, but to keep itself inside. Jesus, remember what Jesus did? He cursed that tree and it died from the inside out. And here is Saul, who's trying to look religious, but he's not, he's not being obedient to what God has called him to do. And he should know these things. He is a Jew. He is, and he was ordained king by Samuel. Samuel's, Samuel follows him around and tells him what to do. But man, when, when, when things get hard, you're going to find out that Samuel always takes it into his own hands because he's worried about what other people think of him. Verse 16, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. So he goes on and he, he talks about the fact that the Philistines win this war because God's taken this kingdom away and all his people scattered. And so so the Philistines went into the towns and they took all of it. 
all the blacksmiths so that nobody could make a sword. They couldn't make a sword from them. The Philistines knew what they were doing in an attempt to oppress the Jews. Chapter 14, verse 1 opens up this way. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines. The Philistine garrison that is on the other side, but he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, within, with it, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, and the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know what Jonathan had gone. So between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the, and the, and the other one was Senna. In front of one faced northward, opposite Michmash, and the other one southward, opposite Gibeah. And when Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, I may be, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. We're starting to see a heart of Jonathan, that he's going to go and do some work, but he's going to call upon the Lord because he knows the Lord has power. He knows the Lord's will deliver him or tell him to leave. He knows the Lord is in control. He gives all glory to the Lord. Now, Saul didn't do that. Saul was because glory to the Lord means to be, uh, it means to be obedient. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, Saul didn't keep the commandments. Saul went on about himself to do it himself, to do what he thought was right in his own eyes. And Samuel called him out on it, and he lost the kingdom because of it. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go, here I am with you, according to all of your heart. And Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men, and he will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, if they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will then we will go up there. For the Lord has delivered them into our hands, and this will be a sign to us. So he says, okay, if, if they tell us to stay there, we'll stay there. God's saying, stay. If they tell us, come up here and we'll, we'll show you something, then God is saying, go up there and we'll take him out because he'll be with us. That's going to be our sign. That's This is the kind of thing Jonathan is doing. By the way, he's going to go take on a garrison of 20 with only two men. And this is, this is the power that God has in our life to deliver us by few or many or whatever it is. God can take care of the problem. Just be obedient to what he has to say and have faith. Verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they have hidden. And then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Dude, is it that? Is that, is that power? Is that faith in God or what? The two of us are going to climb up this rock and we're going to take out that whole garrison because God is with us. Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. And that first slaughter, which Jonathan had his armor bearer made, it was about 20 men and about a half an acre of land. <laughs> These two men go up there and they lay waste to 20 men, 20 Philistines, because God is with them. And he believes that God is with them. God is there to fight our battles. Just read Second Chronicles chapter 20 and the king uh, and King Jehoshaphat's um, issue with, when he's coming against a large army. God kills everybody before he even gets there. That's how powerful faith in God can be. Verse 15, and there was a trembling in the camp and the field and among all the people and the garrison and the raiders who trembled and the earthquake so that it all was very great trembling. And now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and there was the multitude melting away and they went there here and there. So, so Saul looks over and sees all these Philistines freaking out and running away and doing all that and doesn't understand what's happening. And then Saul said to the person, to the people who were with him, now call the roll and see who is gone from us. He has this inkling that somebody from the Israelite army went to do something and the Philistines are running away. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For at the time the ark was the children of Israel. 
And now it happened while Saul was talking to the priest that the noise with which the camp of the Philistine continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. This is going to play kind of an important role. See, the priests were praying over the ark to see, to have confidence and faith and and when he when Saul is kind of bothered by what's going on he tells him to stop praying he tells him to stop praying he takes it all upon himself he he doesn't use the priest to pray out to God to have him to give him wisdom or knowledge or direction or whatever he tells him to withdraw his hand <clears throat> withdraw your hand and then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they went to the battle and indeed every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was very great confusion that the Philistines were killing themselves. They were confused about who was attacking who. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, well, they joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. The Israelites who were afraid and joined the Philistines, well, they came back when this war started to happen. When the Philistines started to lose, they went back to the Israelites. They had the defectors defected back to their own people. Kind of a fair weather fan, I suppose. Verse 22, likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard the Philistines fled, they also followed hand after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle shifted to Beth Avon. By the way, don't take, do not take lightly your actions and people watching your actions. If you take a faithful step and you take a stand for righteousness, others will see it and you may just move people. You may influence them in your circle of influence. You can't change the world, but you can change those who see you. Be uh, Bring in some faith and a little bit of power and strength and a little bit of confidence and others will follow. Verse 24, and, this, and, and the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Saul makes a bunch of stupid decisions here. Saul says, Nobody eats until, my, until I get my vengeance on my enemies. By the way, these are Israelite, these are Israel's enemies, and they're God's enemies. This is Saul speaking of the fact that he's going to keep all his soldiers from eating food and being refreshed until he he gets vengeance. And the Bible tells us that vengeance is mine alone. God says, Don't don't take your vengeance out on people. Leave it to me. Vengeance is mine alone. But Saul makes a silly vow. And he tells him not to eat anything until he gets vengeance on my enemies. By the way, this happened before or during the fact that Jonathan is fighting with the armor bearer so that you understand the timing. He slips away and he goes away. Jonathan and his armor bearer slip away to deal with the Philistines. But at the same time, King Saul makes this, this silly uh, statement, the silly vow. It's an oath before God that, but be, until he gets vengeance on his enemies, no one is supposed to eat. Well, Jonathan doesn't hear it and neither does his armor bearer. And then the Philistines start to freak out and then Saul doesn't understand what's going on. So he sends his army out there and they get this great victory, but they're all tired and they're all hungry and they're all distressed because they haven't been eating because they dealt with this silly vow that Saul, remember, Bear fruit for your other people. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about other people. When you're a tree and you're bearing leaves, bear fruit for other people. Don't turn it about yourself. Saul, it's all about Saul. All about Saul. And you'll see it here in a minute. It says, And when the people had come into the woods, there was honey dripping, but no one put his hand on his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with this oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of his rod and was in the hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put it in his hand to his mouth, and the countenance brightened. And one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look now how, how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. And how much better is the people and eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they had found. For now would, so now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? 
Jonathan doesn't hear the oath, so he eats a little honey and he's refreshed. But then they tell him, look, dad, your dad told us not to eat until he gets vengeance on his enemies. And Jonathan's like, well, that's dumb. Because how much better would we have been in battle had everybody been refreshed and had eaten something? Well, look what happens in verse 31. Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ahijalon. And so the people were very faint. And the people rushed to the spoil and took sheep, oxen, calves, and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. And then they told Saul, look, the people are singing against the, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So Saul makes this stupid oath and everybody's so hungry that they kill this food to eat it, but they don't drain it properly. And the Levitical law says don't eat the blood. So they eat the blood to sin against the God that has delivered them from this. See how, see how sin begets sin, begets sin, begets sin. It's dangerous. When you're a tree and you bear fruit, give fruit to others freely and don't lead them to stumble like Saul and his religiosity, but his failure to care for other people. These stupid O's will lead to really bad places. So he said, you have dealt treacherously, roll a large stone to me this day. And Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep, slaughter them here and eat and do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. So he, he, he relents and he says, look, bring a rock here, bring all your stuff here. You can slaughter it here, drain it here and eat so you don't sin against God. Wow, big religious man here. He wasn't a big religious man a minute ago and now he's being big religious Point the finger, don't sin against God, do it right. He's, he, he's all over the board. His goalpost is everywhere. He's not listening and being obedient to God. He's listening and obedient to his own, his own wants and his own needs and his own pride and arrogance, his own... And really, this just leads to the point that he's just insecure about what people think. He's fearing man and not God. It says, bring me here, all of that stuff. So every one of the people brought his ox in his night and slaughtered it there. And then Saul built an altar to the Lord. And this was the first altar that he had built to the Lord. And now Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. And then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked counsel of God. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. God didn't answer his prayers. Why? Because the kingdom's gone. God left. God left him. He was, he was so busy being about himself and not being obedient to God that God had told him, I'm taking, I'm taking away your kingdom. And so when the, the priest says, let's go ask God, and he's like, I'm all religious, and I'm going to ask God about what he thinks I should do, God doesn't answer. God doesn't answer him. Because God doesn't answer those who, who don't obey him, who don't walk with him. If you're going to pray, the only prayer that, that everyone, that he answers to everyone who prays is repentance to turn away from sin and to believe in God. Other than that, he's not going to answer any of your prayers if you're not walking a life of obedience to him. Bear fruit for others. That's what the Bible says. If you love me, well, keep my commandments. But here's the problem. Now he seeks after him and he doesn't get an answer. He doesn't get an answer that day. And Saul said, come over here, all you chiefs and people who know and see what the sin was, uh, all you chiefs of the people and know and see what this sin was today. For as Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But not a man among all the people answered him. And then he said to Israel, you be on one side and my son and Jonathan will be on the other. So now, because he doesn't look at his, his own sin, he doesn't see his own problems, he doesn't see his own wrongful acts, he starts to blame others for the failure to talk to God. He believes that someone else sinned, and that's why God wasn't talking to him. He didn't see his own sin, he saw other people's sin. The problem is there isn't a sin here. It's only his own, but he doesn't see his own, so he seeks after to figure out who else has sinned. Look what it says. And the people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. So therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast lots between my, Jonathan, between my son Jonathan and me. And so Jonathan was taken. And Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. 
And Jonathan told him, I said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that, that was in my hand. So now I must die. And Saul answered, God do so and more also, you shall surely die, Jonathan. He's just going to kill his own son. He knows his son's in, next in line for the, for the, for the, <laughs> for the kingdom. But he won't take his own pride and arrogance away. Proverbs tells us that there are seven things God hates. A prideful look, a lying tongue, hands that shed, shed innocent blood, a heart that runs, uh, feet that run swiftly to evil, a heart that devises evil plans, and one who, who sows discord among brethren. Liars, cheaters, murderers, and prideful people who don't see the issues as they as they send them. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone has to repent of their sins, but he's got so much pride that he he's going to kill his own son because it's it's his own sin that lost the conversation with God, not Jonathan's, but he won't see it. Thank goodness for God. But the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die? He was accomplished his great deliverance in Israel. Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground. For years worked with God this day. So the people re rescued Jonathan and he did not die. And then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines and the Philistines went to their place. And so Saul takes another step down. Still trying to be religious, still trying to make religious decisions, trying to blame other people, trying to be a, a bigot or a hypocrite, pointing the fingers for sins when he doesn't look at his own sins, right? Jesus says, man, don't take, don't look at the speck in somebody else's eye until you take the plank out of your own. Saul's planks are huge. So, so much blind and so much blind arrogance and pride that he doesn't see that it's his own sin. That has brought him this place. Well, we'll see the the and we'll see how it ends in chapter 15. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way from him to make um he came up from Egypt and now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man and woman and infant and nursing child, ox, sheep, camels, donkeys, everything. The word of the Lord says destroy everything. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tehaman, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get down from among Am um, the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. And so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havalia all the way to Shur, which is in the east of, of Egypt. <clears throat> and he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, well, they were utterly destroyed. So, <sighs> didn't kill the king, didn't kill all their good stuff, all their good animals. The word of the Lord was destroy everything, and they failed. So here's... Verse 10, Saul comes. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Now that's a dangerous thing for God to say. You have not followed my commandments. I regret what I did for you. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. And so Samuel arose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Oh, now he's now it's self monument, not a monument to God. Now, now he's leading himself a self monument. 
See how it's falling? See how he's tumbling down this rabbit hole as he still continues to think he's powerful, but God is not with him and he's doing more and more in his own flesh and seeing himself, his insecurity and his pride and his arrogance are lifting himself up before the people because he worries about man and not God. But the one to be worried about is God. The Bible tells us, hey man, don't worry about the guy who can kill you and just kill your body, but he can't touch your soul. Worry about the one who can destroy your soul by throwing it into hell. That's where we need to be. If we serve man or God, serve God. And don't worry about man. God has an answer for them. But Saul's got this complex. And you'll see that complex just continues to fall down this hole. Fear, insecurity, all these things are kind of floating around Saul now. He's just worried about what other men think. <sighs> And then what happens when he's confronted with his sin? Look what Saul says. <laughs> uh, it, says uh, it says, Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself and he has gone on around, passed by and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, well, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. And then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Oh man, oh man, oh man. What does Saul do? He changes, he, he, he makes his behavior seem religious. There it is again. Oh, but I did. I did the commandments of the Lord. No, you didn't. By the way, a partial truth is still a lie. So if God tells you to utterly destroy everything, but you come up with your own idea of what you should do, destroy most of it, but save some and give it to God, that's not what he ordered you to do. That's not what he said. Destroy it all. There's a reason for that. He has a reason for why he asks you to do things. He has a reason for you to be obedient. Yet Saul decides to do what is, he, he sounds religious. He's making good sounding religious. Gosh, it sounds like he's got fruit, but he doesn't. He's a tree with all show and no substance, not bearing fruit for others and not being obedient to God. Let's, and then Samuel brings the, brings the hurt. It says, and he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? When you, when you were humble in your own eyes, did he not create, make you king? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners of Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder. Oh, now he's blaming other people for doing it. The people took of the plunder. He's the king. He has been ordered to make orders. So the people, now he's blaming the people. Man. But the people took the plunder, sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which could have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as sacrifices as in obeying the Lord of uh, obeying the voice of the Lord? I'll read it again. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is in the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is an iniquity and an idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Well, and then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And now, therefore, please pardon my sins and return to me, and I may worship the Lord. Boy. Well, now he now it's too late. Now he blames the he blames the people. He feared people. He feared the people instead of the Lord. And because he tried to do religious works instead of instead of being obedient to God, he has now had 
his kingship completely taken away from him. Everything is going to spin out of control from here on out for Saul. And that's a dangerous thing. So by the time we get to uh, verse 34, it says, that Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went to his house at Gibeah and Saul and Samuel went, to, went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. And nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord regretted that he had ever made Saul king. In verse chapter 16, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your, whole, your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king amongst his sons. King David. And David walks out of there and David is the man. It's the Davidic covenant, not the Saulitic covenant. Saul never recovered. Saul continued to try to be somehow something special in his own eyes. And he tried to give it a power that made it look religious, but it wasn't obedient to God's word. It's, this isn't hard. This isn't a difficult transition. By the way, by the time Saul falls into uh, demonic oppression and depression and he tries to kill David and he and he spins out of control into paranoia and all these all kinds of things. It's horrible. And then he goes out and he's killed in battle. He's killed by an Amalekite. He could have destroyed the entire Amalekite army because God knew that the Amalekites would come against him, but he didn't. And an Amalekite killed him in battle. It, the battle wasn't even against the Amalekites, but it was an Amalekite in battle who killed him. Our sins always come back to haunt us. You've got to repress them. You've got to turn away from them. You have to walk away from them. Give them up to God. It's called repentance. Walking one direction in your sins, you have to turn around 180 degrees and walk the other way and, and sin no more. It's one thing that we sin little things here and there. We get anxious. We get, uh, we let a bad word slip, whatever. Those are things that we, that our flesh have hard time believing in. And that's why Jesus died for us. So all of those are, are handled. They're all forgiven, but you need to, you've got to admit to God that you did. So you understand what you're dealing with. You can't live this life doing works, doing good people works and looking good. You can't. He doesn't care about your sacrifices. He doesn't care about your actions. He doesn't care about what you do. He cares about obedience to God because obedience to God bears fruit for other people. This is a, a cool story because when you, when, you watch, when you watch Saul try to be something religious that he's not, and you start to look at the churches, even the Pope today, has does have a religious bone in his body. He looks the he's got the tree, he's got the beautiful leaves, but no fruit. No fruit. And it could very well become the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13. Wow. How quickly how quickly we can get swept away by those itching ears, by those doctrines of demons, the things that we want to hear, the that when when we don't listen to sound teaching. But Jesus, going up to a tree, believing it had fruit and didn't, he, he cursed it. So if you look like you have fruit, but you don't, there will become a time as you fall yourself further and further down the rabbit hole of failing to understand and commend Jesus as your Savior, that he will, he'll dry you up from the roots too. The only way to, can, to keep yourself from burning down in the fire or the drought is to, is to plant your tree next to the uh, streams of water. Rivers of water, water, the water of the word, the Holy Spirit, the word of God that, that brings water and keeps your leaves. We'll, we'll finish as we, as I did at Waypoint, we'll finish, we'll, we'll finish with uh, Psalm 1 because that's, it, it goes all the way back to the very, the, the smartest way of going about any of this. If I can get to it. Here's what Psalm 1 says. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his 
and in his law he meditates day and night. And here's here you have Saul walking. Saul is not blessed because he's he's walking in the counsel of the ungodly, and he's walking along paths of sinners, and he's walking and taking seats next to the scornful. He doesn't delight in the law of the Lord. Samuel Samuel delights in the law of the Lord, and he continues to try to get Saul to listen, but he doesn't. He takes it upon himself. Saul is the one who follows the obedience of God. And later on, when Samuel's about to die, everyone says, wow, you know, you followed everything you did. You did everything. You were so powerful for us. Thank you for being such a man of God. He was highly esteemed. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth in fruit its season, whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they're like chaff, which the wind drives away. And therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment for sinner, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Easily done it. There's two kinds of people. Those who obey the word of the Lord, take delight in Jesus and the word, the God that tells us to be obedient to what he tells us to do. And those who, who aren't. And God will, those people, the people who think they're doing good things, but not being obedient to the word of the Lord and not seeking Jesus as their Savior, they're, they're never going to stand with the righteous. They'll be destroyed. They shall perish. That's what it says. I hope this brings it to you. Uh, another thought process of the tree, a, a tree that looks special but doesn't bear fruit for others. And here's Saul, who's, who is God's anointed king, who who failed, who failed miserably. And then what do we have? We've got David, who is such a wonderful picture. And, and the heir apparent and the, and the line of David ends up in the line of Jesus. How important it is to be obedient to God's word that so that the spirit can bear fruit, so that people can see that yet we have leaves and we bear fruit for the kingdom. Be blessed.